Hello and welcome to Life in Wheatley in 1911. I'm just going to share my screen and then we can get going. This presentation has been created from the census of 1911 an archive and other records. With the help of a 1910 valuation survey, we know exactly where almost everyone lived. The names and ages of all the children and others living in the household and the occupations of everyone. This talk is being recorded and you will be sent a link to it together with a longer version of the text with even more detail. First of all, a statistical overview. There were 249 dwellings in the village. The majority were tenanted, as was common in those days. There was a population of 976, of which 402 were in employment. There were a significant number of females at home and not working, as expected in this era. Domestic service and agriculture were the main forms of employment. The sawmill and the brick and lime kiln businesses were the two more industrial sources of work in the village. Wheatley was a self-sufficient village run by its own unitary authority, so it didn't have to consult any district or county council, nor was central government wanting to be involved. Bliss. Wheatley provided services from the cradle to the grave. So starting from birth, Kate Brister, age 27, was the village midwife and district nurse who boarded with Ethelbert Green at the Furs, the house on the northeast corner of Church Road and Holloway Road. First thing you needed was the essential pinter. Deliveries were plentiful with four milk sellers in the village. First was George Allen, whose son Joseph married into the Munt family, which controlled market gardeners as gardening, as we will see later. Maybe the Allens benefited from cows pastured on Bullsdown, which was owned by the Munts. Then there was Caleb Harris, who was related to the Munts and to the Allens. Perhaps it was inevitable that many would eventually marry into the huge Munt family. Next was James White with the White and Welford round, but no Munt connection. Lastly was William Dennis at Wheatley Hill Farm, who had a dairy herd. The infant school was at the back of Bell Lane and had about 30 pupils. It was run by 75-year-old widower Rosalind Roberts, who lived at Three Kiln Lane. The three assistant teachers here shown in the photo were wearing black in mourning for King Edward VII, but they did not live in the village. Incidentally, they earned £12 a year. In addition, private tuition was available from Herbert Fernie, who lived in part of 76 Church Road, and 84-year-old widowed Francis Gale, who lived at the old parsonage in High Street. The National School was on Church Road, seen here in 1907-8. It was run by Rhys Lation, whose wife Eliza and daughter Winifred also taught here. Lation Road was named after him. There were about 120 pupils. Education had by then been made compulsory up to the older age of 13. We know four other assistants at the school, Caroline Nibbs, Lily Price Ellison, Annie Elizabeth Enser and Clara Holland. 
What about health services in the village? There were two doctors whom we know about, Dr. Barnes and Burgoyne Stanley. The latter lived at 76 Church Road, where, by 1913, the sanatorium had morphed into the Rose and Lily Tea Gardens, a very strange change. But Wheatley was without an undertaker as William Mitchell, after whom Mitchell Dean is named, had retired. Perhaps Chapman Builders had taken this on, although the Kelly Directory does not say so. So it's not clear how you held your funeral. If as some do today, you relied on the local shops, food shopping was no different then, standing in a queue and passing the time of the day. But most of us now have a regular supermarket shop or delivery, so do not need a visit to the local grocer, butcher or baker. There were no specialist greengrocers then. Starting from the west end of High Street, there were grocers at 11 to 13, where the three young Dungey brothers, aged 17 to 21, Robert, William Bernard and Montague, had taken over from their parents, who had emigrated to Australia in 1910. Originally, there were two shops here, the other being run by Joseph Frampton, selling wooden buckets and other such items. He was the one of the last known inhabitants to have worn a particular smock for which Wheatley was well known. There was a bakery at 39 High Street, later Clark's Greengrocer, and now the pharmacy. This was run by widower John Clayton, who owned the land through to Church Road, with a house there bearing his name today. The photograph shows it when it was run by the Hyde family. There was another baker in the village, Edwin Hawes, who was carrying on his business from Penny Cottage, a five-room house in Church Road. It is not clear where the shop space was, but perhaps they just sold from the front room. Crossing over the much narrower than today Holloway Road, before 13 feet were lopped off what is now number 53, to widen the road and add pavements. This shop was a grocery, bakery and butcher's business, leased in 1911 by the young 28-year-old James Hughes and his wife Keziah, who was 10 years his senior. Further along at Oxford House, the business had been established as a general store in 1866. In 1911, Charles and Emily Mould lived with their two young sons and a domestic servant. So business was presumably brisk and now included a food section. Today, it is the language school. On to butchers. 50 High Street was the site of charming cottages until about 1900. In 1911, the occupier was the Premier Meat Company. So its use as a butcher seems to have been established by then. Samuel took the shop over in 1936. There was another butcher's shop at 64 High Street, now Chillingworth House. This was owned and run by Arthur and Ellen Battard. Arthur had been the licensee of the White Hart for a few years over the turn of the century. The third butchers were brothers John George Rose and Joseph Rose, both single and in their 60s, and also members of this family who were involved in farming and renting out cottages. They lived in Jessamine Cottage, now number one Church Road with two spinster sisters and two servants. Opposite on the corner of Church Road and High Street, they had an abattoir and a butcher's shop tacked on to the end of what is now to Church Road. They also owned and occupied the green on which livestock were held 
awaiting their fate. There was a drapery at 47 High Street, owned and run by Annie Liff, married but with no evidence of a husband. Living with her were two daughters, one described as a lady's companion, the other a nurse. They may have fulfilled these roles at home too. In my house at 48 High Street, the post office was run by Alice Tubb, who had just taken over from her mother, Maud. Apart from Alice, there were five postmen in 1911, three listed as being involved in the Postal Telegraph. At 45 High Street was the unusual combination of a hairdresser and tailor in the person of George English. Frederick Stamp sold china and glass at 58 to 62 High Street, and there had been a saddler at 65 High Street, but this had closed after 1910. And then there was Wheatley's department store at 95 to 97 High Street, which had opened in 1876 and sold millinery, grocery, ironmongery and medicines. There was a sweet shop run by Clara Holland at One Farm Close Lane, now One Crown Square. There was a Sheldon Cycle Shop at 94 Church Road. A coal yard adjacent station run by the Whedon Brothers. And perhaps separately, another member of the Sheldon family, Edward, was a self-employed Coleman. Now the pubs. In 1911, there were 11 pubs or beer houses. The latter did not sell spirits. How many remain? Just three. Charles Heath ran the King and Queen with his wife, Elizabeth. Living with them were three sons aged 18 to 35, who were all to fight in the Great War, and also one sister, one boarder, and one servant. William Spearing ran the White Hart with his wife Lizzie, and five children aged 5 to 21 were living with them. While the photo is from the 1940s, perhaps it was the meeting point for the hunt in 1911. William Toms ran the Crown, of which we have no good photos, with his wife Annie, their son Llewellyn Richard, who served in the Great War, 13-year-old daughter, and three boarders. Alfred Gunn ran the son with his wife, Kate. The King's Arms was run by Joseph Sturgis and his wife, Esther. They had four children aged three to 12 and one servant. The plough was run by George Wald and his wife, Ellen and they had two young children. The Red Lion, which was a beer house, was run by John Martin and his wife, Harriet. It is now the new club. And the Cricketers in Littleworth was another beer house run by the widowed Anne Brooks. With two drinking holes with the name railway in them, I don't see how the railway brought new opportunities to drink in the village. We don't know when the railway tavern at 44 High Street opened, but it was run in 1911 by Alfred Phelps and his wife Priscilla. And the railway hotel, now the sidings, was managed by Henry Brown and his wife Emma. Two grown-up children in their 30s were also involved in the business. Now we come to the all-important market gardening business, which almost certainly fed weekly and neighboring villages with most of its fresh produce and probably meat too. 15 people were involved in this business, which was dominated by the Munt family with James, a tenant of this 15-acre site, Edge Red, in Littleworth, 
which was owned by Mrs. Bird. Other tenants were the Smith family, who lived in the now demolished Littleworth house. George and his wife Anne, later known as Auntie Smith, had three sons in the business. Auntie rode an old sit up and beg cycle with handlebars curved backwards so that the rider could sit up straight like a dog in a begging position. Three members of the Munt family occupied holdings on the north and south sides of the high street right in the village centre. It is pure speculation but this may have been almost a pick your own approach. The three plots are now being pointed out. They are number 539, 538, 484, which is where the shops are today. 537 was the White Hart and 535 is Linton House. But this wasn't the end to it as James Munt Senior owned and occupied the 21 acre Bullsdown site numbered 465 and shaded blue, as I'm showing you. The Munns were not the only family involved. Plot 427, adjacent to the manor, was let by the Rose Brothers to William Toms, who lived at nearby 54 High Street. Other allotments, but not necessarily for, for the commercial growing of produce, were what is now Templars Close and the area to the north of the quarry up to Park Hill, before any houses were built there. And there was a plot immediately to the east of the church. Most households would have had someone competent at sewing, but if not, where did you get your clothes altered or your dresses made? Susan Stevens, a 69-year-old spinster, lived in the almhouses Bethrafra, over here, built by the Shotover estate circa 1900. And the picture shows it in 1908. Others were Florence Toms, an 80-year-old widow at Seven Kiln Lane, the unmarried Susanna Munt, living in this long demolished row of cottages in Robins Row. Eliza Hancock, another unmarried girl, living with her widowed mother at One Kiln Lane, although she was more skilled being shown as a dressmaker. And unmarried dressmaker Mary Pym, living with her widowed mother Rose as a tenant of Mrs. Anne Frampton. And the same for your laundry, if you didn't want to do it yourself. Lawn dresses were the widowed Elizabeth Stanley at Blenheim on the Littleworth Road. Mary Putt, another widow at 27 Church Road. And Mary Collins. Rose Pym, mother of dressmaker Mary, was described as a boarding house keeper, presumably of the Temperance Hotel, now the Mary Bells. She is seen ringed in this gorgeous 1908 photograph of the Women's Wednesday Afternoon group. And what about a cobbler? Thomas Putt, living at number seven Blenheim in the Terrace of Cottages, was a bootmaker and dealer. His business was late, later taken over by his son Stephen, known as Stivy. Another was the unmarried Henry Merritt, who had just moved into Four Bell Lane. George Farthing was a bootmaker living in the house which is now Six Farm Close Lane. He was married to Elizabeth, sister to John Russell, who had been the postmaster. There were two main builders. First was Cullens, the largest construction organization in the village with a site at the top of Bell Lane leading into Station Road. They also leased a substantial yard on a one acre plot on the north of Church Road opposite Friday's Lane. William, 
The father of the surviving two out of three brothers was 98 in 1911 and lived on the main site at 17 Bell Lane. Arthur lived at Quarry House, 2 Westfield Road, and Francis at 44 Ladder Hill. The Chapmans were probably the best known name in this, in this trade, the next best known trade name in this trade in Wheatley. Their business was based in 62-year-old John's High Street house, now known as the Robins. They had another yard on the south of High Street, just east of the manor. John and wife Helen had 10 children, four of them over 21 and still living at home, including Arthur, who was 29, and Harold, who was 22, both plumbers and glaziers. And there were several other smaller building outfits. Eeper weeper, chimney sweeper, had a wife but couldn't keep her. Not a saying that I know. However, a reconciled Smith, Wheatley's only resident chimney sweep, did keep his wife, and they had four sons who all worked in the Headington Quarry. Blacksmiths. Charles Sheldon had been the main village blacksmith operating out of the forge in Church Road at the top of the garden to Forge House, 99 High Street. After his death, the Forge moved to Crobble House, run by Walter, Walter Brazil, assisted by Charles Sheldon's son, Wilfred, and perhaps also assisted by Henry Chandler, who lived in the 29 to 35 Church Road Terrace, as well as by George Bartlett from Mott House. There were 14 people employed on the railway. Edgar Phillips, living at Greystones, was the station master. Llewellyn Jackson and Henry John Bushnell were signalmen. Henry Nelms, Thomas Johnson, and Henry Holland were plate layers. William Wet Mells and Mark Shorter were gangers. Richard Shepherd, a packer, Charles Redmond, a railway servant, and Wilfred Cox, a railway worker. Wilfred later became a signalman and bought Mott House in 1958. The Briggs Works were started on the site of the old house in Westfield Road in 1742, but moved to Littleworth by the early 1900s. The business was owned and run by the Cooper family over several generations and in 1911 they all lived together at the lodge 25 Park Hill, with three of the family in the business. The business employed another 11 people. These three lime kilns, originally there were 10, are believed to be the only surviving ones in Oxfordshire. What was left of the poor quality limestone from the quarry was converted in these kilns to agricultural lime. Sawmill. This business started in 1893 after William Avery had spotted the site from a passing train. The sawmill stripped and sawed trees into timber for the furniture business, businesses in High Wycombe. There were nine other sawmill workers identified in the census. Apparently it was a favorite, but jolly uncomfortable, haunt for the canoodling couples. Tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, we had them all. William Fisher was a tinker, an itinerant tinsmith who lived at number nine, Blenheim. George English was the tailor referred to earlier. There were a number of weekly serving soldiers noted in the book, They Were a War. Other than Arthur Miles, whom the census lists as overseas military and who was killed in the war, these lived in the village in 1911. And three serving sailors must have been away when the census was taken. Rich ladies, yes, 
all widows living on their own means, and here they are listed in the table. And there were three others probably in the same category. Poor man. There were three other elderly ladies living in the almshouses. Susanna Stevens working as a needlewoman, Anne Clements and Charlotte Hayfield. Beggarman was a 42 year old blacksmith, Alfred Butler, who was a vagrant. There was no thief category in the 1911 census. Domestic staff. 1911 nationally saw the peak in domestic service in the country and in Wheatley it was the largest category of employee with 64 people in service, probably not all employed in the village. Domestic service was by now regarded as a genteel occupation for young ladies, rather than farming in previous times. And this was one of the causes of resistance in getting girls back on the land in the Great War. Also, men thought that women weren't up to it and with lower wages would drag down their own earnings. No comment. Farming. Here is a photo of the Walker family of Bullsdown. The map also, the farmers in, in 1911 all rented their farms other than the Rose Brothers and James Munt. And, and here they are being pointed out to you. Walker had the biggest farm. Dennis had his farm here. Shepherds, the Roses, the Robins, is, uh, and the Roses had a variety of sites all over the place. The map also shows other large land holdings or uses. So we've got private allotments, which I showed you earlier. This is the How Trust, William Avery over here. And what else can we see? Oh, that was Marlborough Cottage, as it was. And that was the Vicarage Holding. How did you sell your house? Presumably you needed a solicitor, and there were two in Wheatley. Joseph Burt lived with his wife, Rose, and five children under 21 at 5 Westfield Road. And Arthur Wells, who lived with his wife, Elizabeth, and one servant at the Turrets, 19 Park Hill. It seems that the legal profession was already a profitable career. Mary Bells, Mr. Atherton, who did not live in the village, was boarding housekeeper to the Mary Bells, assisted as already noted by Rose Pym. The home of rest for convalescent church workers, I'm not quite clear how many of there were of these, but it was at Seven Park Hill and it was run by Catherine Pastor. There appear to have been just two active religions at the time, Reverend William Curry, the 50 year year old vicar of the Church of England, St Mary's Church, was living with his wife, Amy, three daughters and two servants at the vicarage, the current Moorland House. There was also a lay reader, George Ogilvy Grant, who lived at Bethrafra with a servant, and an organist, both resident in the village. The organist, Arthur Samuel Sheldon, lived with his father Samuel at 90 Church Road. William Newton presided over the Congregational Church and lived with his wife Mary and two daughters at Rose Cottage in the High Street. Today this is the site of Rose Villa and a house behind. There is no evidence of a Roman Catholic priest until the 1920s. So this was how life was in 1911. And that's it, folks. Thank you very much.